Good afternoon. Hello, anybody there? Hello. First of all, I need to tell you the news. Have you, you've heard the news that there's been a royal baby in England, but have you heard that, have you heard the name they've given the baby? No, they've given a name to the baby. It's Rihanna Beyonce Cartney <laughs> Windsor. I thought that was really quite, quite 21st century of them. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming, thank you for staying so late. I, I hope you've been enjoying this extraordinary conference. I've, I've attended so many interesting sessions. Just today I've been inspired and excited by quite a lot of things that I've heard and, and seen. And I hope that's been your experiences as well. Um, thank you for staying to the bitter end. I hope, uh, I hope you won't regret it by the time it's, it's finished. Um, what am I going to do? Um, if you saw my session on classroom management, you probably know that what I mainly do is practical stuff. That's my experience. I'm not an academic researcher. I'm not a university person. I, I, I'm interested in small things that happen in the classroom. And that's mainly what I want to be showing you this afternoon. Um, the title of the talk was uh, Upgrade. And it's about this thing called Demand High. So I'm just going to do a little bit of talk at the beginning to tell you what I mean by Demand High. But that's not, a, that's not going to be a large part of the talk. That will just be the introduction. And then I'd like to show you practically what I mean by it. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me, We'll have a little introduction, first of all, to this, this, uh, oh, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not going to give you a, a bucket full of ideas. You're not going to go out of this session with a lot of recipes for exciting things to do in the classroom. I'm afraid I have an empty bucket for you. But I hope all the same that it is a very practical talk, um, because what I'd like to plant is, is a seed. Uh, a seed, maybe a, a handful of seeds, a handful of seeds of ideas that, although they're not the recipe for a single thing to do in the classroom, not a single activity, it's just possible that they'll affect a whole pile of things that you do on a daily basis in your classroom. Some of the ideas you may think, that's not for me, that's fine. Maybe one or two of the things will resonate with you and you might take something away that you can plant in your own classroom. Um, the ideas I'm talking about are, are concocted by me and somebody who's been mentioned a few times in this conference. I don't know if you recognize this person. One or two people. This is Adrian Underhill. Um, Adrian Underhill was mentioned uh, in connection with uh, the inner workbench, which is the sort of thing that I'm talking about today in many ways. Um, and of course, he's most famous as the person who designed the phonemic chart. He was the first person to think of the idea of taking the symbols of the sounds of English and putting them on a poster that you could have on the wall in your classroom. And it was a very simple idea, but it proved to be very, very powerful. And many classrooms around the world nowadays have a poster on them with the sounds of English. Of course, lots of people ripped off this idea, copied it. Lots of publishers made their own charts, but his was the original. Um, in fact, his was the original. You can see the power of the original chart because the phonemes are escaping off the chart and are slowly crawling over his body now, uh, like some alien invasion. So this is the original chart and this is Adrian having a cup of tea in my house. Uh, so. Adrian and I have been having a conversation about teaching for oh, many, many years now. We worked together a lot and we, we, we sit down and we talk a lot about teaching. That's our research method. Um, and I'd like to just throw at you a few doubts about my own teaching that I, I had over the years and that Adrian concurred with himself. And you can take this as something maybe to think of about your own teaching as well. Are these things true for you? I don't know if they're true for you, but you can ask yourself whether any of these doubts have echoes in your own mind. 
Well, when I teach, I hope that my learners have an enjoyable time in my lesson. Sort of a priority nowadays, isn't it? Teach, uh, learners should have a good time. They should enjoy their lessons. No more boring lessons. We need to have exciting, fun lessons. I, well, I, I, I said to myself, I really hope that that's true about my lessons. And I, I'm pretty sure they're learning something. I mean, there's not much point being a teacher in a classroom with students if they're only running around having fun and not learning anything. So those are my two sort of positive wishes about my own lesson. But I started to wonder, is there potential for more learning? And I began to have some serious doubts about what it is that I was doing in the classroom. I wondered, is it possible I'm actually putting too much energy, too much worry, too much time into all the add-ons? And what do I mean by add-ons? By add-ons, I mean those things that have sort of grown up around the business of learning the language. All those games and quizzes and extra activities and things that in some cases seem to have almost become the reason that we're in the classroom. That those add-ons have become more important than the language that we're studying. I don't know if you recognize that description at all. And I began to wonder, could the learning of the language itself be fun without needing extra things added on? to bring the fun into the lesson. Because so often the students get into those quizzes and they're running around, point scoring teams, etc., etc. That that just takes over completely. And I, I, I observe a lot of lessons, and something I observe in lessons I watch is that sometimes you completely lose track of what the, what the lesson's about. I saw a lesson, it was a, an hour's lesson. It was meant to be about phrasal verbs. And it was a team competition with students going here and going there and filling in forms and talking to each other and by the end they had had a fantastic time, a great time, lots of talking, lots of moving around, lots of fun and not a single student in the class knew that the lesson had been about phrasal verbs. It, they just didn't know because it had been such a lot of other stuff accreted around it. Could my lessons be more challenging maybe? More engaging? Rather than by adding on the games and entertainment, could I find the engagement in the language itself? Is it possible that lang just working with language could be interesting and exciting in its own right? Is it possible that some of the things I do in class have become ritualized? That I do things that, because I think they're things that teachers do. I put students in pairs, put students in groups, tell them to have a discussion, tell them to do this, tell them to do that. But maybe I'm not constantly asking myself, is doing that actually leading to any learning? When I put them into a group and they have a discussion for six minutes or so, and then at the end I say, OK, great, thank you very much. Was that interesting? And they politely say, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. And then I say, OK, right, let's move on and do the next thing. Um, what was the point of that six minutes? Well, they were in a group and there's a bit of fluency, I suppose, and they had a discussion. But really, can I... Can I write down clearly what learning came out of that? Am I, am I sure what I thought might come out of it? Did I just put them into a group and ask them to talk? Because that's what communicative language teachers do. That's what we've been taught to do. That's what our observers tell us we should do more of. But why? What, am I really clear what came out of it? So this is the question. Might I be under-challenging my students? Might they actually be more intelligent than I'm giving them credit for? Might they actually be humans capable of being excited by learning itself? Might it be possible that I don't need to add on that fun running around game to something? That actually, if we just worked on the language and found the fun in that, that that would be enough? Is it possible I could stop covering material? You know what I mean by covering? turning the pages of a book just so that I can say I have turned the pages of the book. You know when your director or head of department or somebody says you have to get through three units by the 25th of October or something like that. What does that lead to? It leads to people turning pages of a book. <laughs> speed paging. Speed paging. But speed paging isn't learning. Speed paging is turning the pages of a book. Could I start 
to get permission from the people above, from myself, from the students, to go at the speed of the learning. Because the speed of the learning is very different, and the speed of the learning is much slower. And what I'm thinking about here, I'm not thinking about, I need a new methodology. I need a whole new way of doing things. I'm not talking about that at all. All I'm talking about is a, a, a tweak. A tweak is an incredibly small, I like doing that, an, an incredibly small change. In the old days, you know, when you were trying to tune in an old radio, anybody under 50 probably doesn't know what I'm talking about. When you're trying to tune in a radio to one of those distant radio shortwave stations, you, you, had to, you couldn't just go like that. You had, to, you had to tweak it. That's all I'm talking about. Can I teach in whatever way I'm teaching and just tweak it very slightly? Tweak it in order to start thinking more about where is the learning, can I get more learning happening? If all that sounds like a bit pie in the sky, that's fine, I understand that, because what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you some examples of what I'm talking about uh, later in the talk. Every student, every learner, every person has a current learning edge. And the learning edge is where you've got to at the moment. So, in my learning of Hungarian, I've got to, I've got to hear. And beyond this edge, beyond this cliff in front of me, there is a void, there is chaos, there is uncertainty, unknowing, all those things that I don't yet understand and I don't really know about. So what's a teacher's job? A teacher's job is to gently... It's that noise again. Gently nudge the student further forward so that the learning edge moves forward. The learning edge is not fixed. It's changing all the time. Or maybe push your student off the edge. <laughs> that's quite a, it's quite a dramatic approach to teaching, that one. I do that sometimes, but maybe, maybe nudge is a better word than, than push. So, out of the conversations I had with Adrian and out of the doubts we had about teaching, we came up with this idea that we called Demand High. As I say, it's not a method, it's, it's simply an idea. And the idea is, can I nudge them a little bit more than I do? Can I get rid of the, quite a lot of the add-ons and get, the, get something more out of the, the content that I'm working with? So Demand High teaching is a nudge. And it's a nudge, not at the level of a class, but it's a nudge precisely at an individual's learning edge. So that means it's different for you, different for you, different for you, different for you. And that requires me to work at different levels at different times within the same class. Now that's already a challenge to me as a teacher. And it's something I was talking about a little bit yesterday in classroom management. How can we work not just at the speed of the, the fast four or five students, but how can we work at everybody's pace? How can we do lots of one-to-one -one lessons and still keep it a class lesson? So Demand High is a nudge precisely at an individual's learning edge. And the aim is to upgrade. You can't upgrade the whole language, but you can upgrade them from wherever they are to somewhere that is slightly better than where they are. And I'm talking a sentence at a time, or a sound at a time. Is it possible that I can move a student so that they are slightly better in one sentence? In writing it, or in speaking it, in forming it. They're slightly better. And constantly push lots of people through a lesson so that they all get slightly better. Which means that through the lesson as a whole, by the end, everybody is significantly better. This is, this, you're probably saying, but that's what I do. Of course that's what I do. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe it is what you're doing all the time. But I think as teachers, a lot of the time, what we're doing is we're doing the exercise. We're doing the task. And we're not quite clear where the learning is going on. We check the answers. Okay, great, you got 10 correct answers. But what learning did that lead to? Have you really internalized it? Can you do something with it? Can I... With Demand High, I'm saying, okay, do the exercises, use your course book. It's not saying don't use anything that you use, but find the places to push just a little bit more. 
Because all those slightly betters add up over time. They add up quite surprisingly quickly over time. And they add up to greater awareness, to greater knowledge, to greater skill, and to more learning. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to try and give you some examples of what I, what I, mean, by, what I mean by this. If I summarize demand high as one question, it's this. Am I engaging the full human learning potential of the students in my class? They're humans, and humans have massive degrees of potential, interest, capability of learning. What schools tend to do in general very often is close that down. For lots of reasons, they close down that natural impetus and the students go off and they become hooligans or they, they paint on walls or whatever. Can I find a way to open up their natural desire to learn? We are humans, we love learning. That's what we do all the time, different things. And it gets closed down sometimes. But can I find a way to tap back into that? So imagine, here's a role play activity for you. Imagine you're an English teacher. Can you do that? Imagine you're an English teacher. Imagine you've got a nice class. Can you imagine that? Yeah? Imagine you like your students, yeah? Okay? Um, imagine you're working with a course book, and it's a reasonably good course book. You have no big problems with it. Can you imagine that? Yeah? Imagine you've got a really high salary. Can... <laughs> That's impossible. You can't imagine. Okay, forget that one. <laughs> Forget that one. You can't imagine that. No. Okay. Okay. So imagine you're an English teacher. And you've got a fairly low-level student. And you realize they don't seem to know anything about the present perfect. So it's just an imaginary situation. You realize that they don't know anything about the present perfect. Using, using a course book, you plan to work for 45 minutes on this to help this particular student, but maybe the, the whole class as well. Will this student, will your student be any good at the present perfect by the end of your 45 minutes? Honestly. <laughs> okay. Just quickly tell the person next to you the answer to that question. Will they be any good at the present perfect by the end of 45 minutes? I know it's a silly question, I know, I know. So many variables. You're probably all saying, but there's so many variables. Well, of course there are. Will there be any good? Yes? Uh, yeah. Not necessarily. Some of you seem quite confident. Well, of course, I'm a good teacher. Of course they'll, of course they'll, go, they'll go out knowing the present perfect. Some of you seem a bit less confident. Is, let's just think, what does a student need to know to use the present perfect? Or any bit of grammar. Students meeting a new piece of grammar. They need to recognize it from amongst other items within longer text. Recognize it when it is written as examples and in explanations. Recognize when it's heard in isolation and in the flow of speech. Notice and understand how the basic form is made, words ending variation. Know the specific... Oh. Okay, you can... Don't try and read it. This is my attempt at a list. I'm sure it's not correct or complete. But if you start to think about it, in order for a student, a learner, to own a new piece of grammar, there's an incredible amount that they have to do. It's a real challenge to come to terms with a new piece of grammar. And the chances of you being able to do all of that from first meeting in 45 seconds, I would say it's... Sorry? What? Sorry? In 45 seconds. Okay, let's look at a course book. I love that animation. Okay, you don't, you don't need to be able to read this. I'm going to tell you what's on the course book page if you can't see it very clearly. This is a contemporary course book. It's widely used. I'm not going to name it. 
um, but it's very widely used, uh, very, very, very well liked generally. And I'm, I'm not picking on this course book to say it's good or bad. I'm just showing it as an example of a typical, normal, current course book. This is the present perfect in this course book. What have we got? Okay. Well, up here we've got we've got two examples. This is the first time students have met the present perfect, and they've got two examples. I'll say that again. They've got two <laughs> examples. My goodness, I'm just thinking of me trying to learn a foreign language, and I haven't met a bit of grammar before. And the only thing I've got to go on are two pieces of language that include that very complicated and strange piece of grammar. And I'm thinking, could a student possibly begin to make sense of a new piece of grammar from two examples? It seems to me very odd, I have to say. They've got two examples, and then what comes next? What comes next? Uh, we have uh, two rules about how to use present per how to make uh, present perfect statements. And because course books are so crammed together nowadays, and they have to put in so many things, this is very common that the rules are presented as a gap fill exercise. So not only has the poor student got to try and make sense of an incredibly complicated rule about how to form it, they've also got to put in the gaps, which in theory is guided discovery, which is a good thing, but in practice is nonsense. Um, then there's a listening, which includes examples of the present perfect, followed by uh, an exercise. There are five gap-filled sentences. These are sentences from the listening, which obviously include present perfect. Well, okay so far, you're probably thinking, that's fairly typical. Yeah, I recognize that sort of thing. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the present perfect in this course book. Present perfect statements, that it. Finished. We've done it. Now, it goes on, the unit goes on. Look, what have we got here? We've got two, two more gap fill rules. This is for questions and negatives, which I would count as, you know, another grammar item and another grammar item. You know, you need to learn these separately because they're not all the same thing and they, they can get mixed up and confused. And then we've got seven gap fill uh, questions to practice, questions and negatives, possibly a bit of statements as well. And I look at that and I think, if I was a student and I didn't know the present perfect and I saw that, I can't imagine how I could possibly learn the present perfect from that. Now, as I say, I'm not saying it's a bad course book. I'm saying it's an absolutely normal, typical, contemporary course book. This is, this is how they go. Um, there's another example of relative clauses. I won't show you that one, but let me just give you a conclusion. You could not possibly learn the grammar items from the work in the books alone. I'm not saying the books are bad. I'm saying this is what books are like nowadays. But that's good news. It's good news because it means teaching is needed. There's a role for us. There's something to do. Our role despite the fact that we are being pushed into it by directors and ministries who seem to think the book is the course, our role is to argue that very loudly and say, no, the book is not the course. The book is the teaching that happens with the course book. And there is, an, as you can see from that example, there's a lot of need for teaching. If you only do what's in the course book, they won't learn the present perfect. But if you expand a little bit on that, if you do a little bit more, if you have a little bit more practice, a little bit of attempts at production, saying things, things that a teacher can add to the experience of working with the course book, then we start to have a possibility that they will take something away from a present perfect lesson. So the books are not bad, but they're not the course. And we need to fight back with people who tell us, just turn the pages of the book, get through the units, cover these pages and everything will be fine. Covering pages does not lead to learning. Okay, that's the end of the rant. I shall stop ranting now. I shall stop complaining so loudly. I'd like to show you some, some practical ideas. And I'd like to show you some very... I'm sure a lot of things I'm going to show you are things you do already, things you know about. Um, I'm simply going to show you things and 
hope that I can emphasize why I think they're useful, interesting, or important. Um, and the first comment I'd like to make, following on from what I've just been saying about books, having very often two or three examples of new grammar items. First thing I'd like to say is examples are input. It's a brilliant way of learning about the language. The more examples you see of language at work, the more you can intake it, the more you can put it into your head and start to process it. And it's an astonishing thing how examples have gone away from English language teaching course books, by and large. There are, in, the, in, in old books, like, I don't know if any of you know Streamline, for example, there used to be lots of examples of language, and students learned from that. It had a lot of problems as a course book, but it was very helpful from the point of view of offering students ideas about how the language worked. So examples are input, and playing with examples is practice. So what I'm suggesting at the beginning here is that offer your students more examples. If you don't have, if your course book has two or three examples, offer some more. Offer extra examples. If, you, if, you, if you're comfortable with it, you can just spontaneously suggest some sentences. Maybe write them on the board or dictate them to the students. If you're not comfortable with that, you can research that in advance. You can actually go and look on the internet or in other grammar books or whatever and find more examples. Examples are very powerful and they're, they're a great way students can start to work out the patterns from the examples. And when you start playing with them, you've got something really interesting. A lot of course books jump directly from input about this is how a language item works. They jump directly into, okay, now do some communicative practice with that. And that seems a very big jump to me. When I've tried to learn languages, I'm not a very good language learner at all. When I try to learn languages and somebody says, okay, this is how this piece of grammar works. Now, get into a pair and have a conversation with your neighbor about what you're going to do next Tuesday and all the things you're going to buy in the shops. And I just go, what? I, I've hardly begun to get my head around how this bit of language works. I, I'm just going to sit there silent if you ask me to have a communicative conversation with somebody else. Yes, the eventual goal is communicative use. We want our students to be able to go out into the real world and communicate and understand the communication that they hear of or, or read. But that doesn't mean that the whole road towards that has to be communicative. I think it's a complete, complete mistake in a lot of contemporary teaching that is being pushed out at people that the idea that we need to be communicative from the start. There's a lot of fun in non-communicative playing around with language. Getting the words in your head, moving the words from here to here, just articulating English, getting your mouth and your tongue in the right place is really hard. It's quite tough to do. And there's scope in doing that with ready-made sentences. Examples are ready-made sentences. The students don't need to worry about creating the sentence, which means that we can have fun just with playing with the sentences. I'll show you what I mean. Um, I don't know how well you can read that from... from uh, is, are the sentences readable? We've got a lot of present perfect sentences. Most of them involve never. Um, most of them involve never. Let's take an example. Okay, I don't know if you can see the one I'm pointing to up here. Okay. Um, I pointed it again in case it wasn't clear. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask a student, one of my students, hello students, I'd like to ask one of my students, could you read the sentence, please? Could, sorry, could you just wave to me so I know, yes, hello, could you read the sentence? Okay, thank you. Did you believe her? No. Okay, it's not your son, it's her. Do you believe her? Okay, you say why not, do you believe her? There's quite a lot of people saying, no, they don't believe you. Why don't you believe her? Sorry, who said the sentence? You, you're talking about yourself in the third person, yes? <laughs> okay, just, you, just, you, don't, <laughs> okay, yes, sorry, why, why don't you believe her? Oh, you read this, sorry, okay, I'm, okay. Okay, I'm getting really confused now. You read the sentence, right, okay. 
Sorry, so you're talking about her? Yeah. And she's just reading it? Okay. Okay. How, how, could she, how could she say it in a way that you believed more? What, what could you do to make it more believable? You, I'm sorry, you have to speak louder to reach me up here on the stage. Intonation. What about intonation? Okay. Could you wave so I know where you are? Oh, you're right at the back. Okay. Okay. In what different way? What, what could she do to sound more convincing? Okay, could you give us an example? Oh. <laughs> Did you believe her? I, I can't tell if you're saying yes or no. <laughs> no, you didn't, they didn't believe you either. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. No, we're not changing the word. We're not changing the word. We're not changing the word. No. Let's have somebody over here. Can we have, a, have somebody over in here? Can you say the sentence? Sorry, could you, again, could you indicate? Thank you. Hello. Don't add words. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> don't, don't add words, yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay, do you believe her? No, no you're very fussy. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, okay. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't hear what you're saying. I, I, I'll come back to you. But just, can, can I ask you? I, I'm sorry to embarrass you. Can I ask you to stand up? Okay. Okay. You put you put your papers down and give them to somebody next to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like you to say the sentence again. This time, listen to her, but also watch her. Yeah? Also, <laughs> also, also, also watch her. I'd like you to watch her face. Does she move her eyebrows or anything? Or does she wiggle her nose? Or Watch her head. Does she do anything with her head? Watch her hands and her arms. And watch all of her. Yeah? When she says the sentence, does she do anything, basically? Okay? Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I know you're terribly keen to get this over with. <laughs> okay, just, just wait. Okay, now everybody looking at her? You're hiding, that's not fair. <laughs> okay. Oh. Did she do anything? Did she do anything? What did she do? With her hands? What did she do with her hands? She nodded her head. Like that? Is that what she did? Is that what she did? Ah, show us what she did with her hands. Could you stand up, please? <laughs> so I heard serves you right. That's not very friendly. <laughs> okay, can you show what she did with her hands? Why does she do that? Why does she do that? Emphasize, making it stronger, yes? I didn't say you could sit down. <laughs> okay, thank you. You can sit down, yes. Okay. So we've got emphasizing with the hands. You think shaking the head, like that, was it? Oh, side to side. Why side to side? Ah, it's got a no meaning, hasn't it? Never, no. Okay. Okay. By the way, so I'm just going to pause for a second. You may think, you know, I'm being horrible, making her to stand up and asking different things. And I probably am being horrible. I'd just like to say that what I'm showing you is something that, that I do, exactly what I do with students in the class. There's a tremendous fear of putting students in the spotlight. People often say, oh, I don't want to put students in the spotlight. I think that's wrong. I think we need to get students used and comfortable with being in the spotlight. Because when you do that, you can start to go all round class and say, you try it, you try it. So, okay, stand up, say it. And... If you don't sort of jump on errors and say, no, that was bad or what, if it's all done in a playful way with people laughing, not laughing at, but laughing with the situation, then suddenly you've got a different kind of laboratory for working with language. 
It's a completely different kind of way of working. It's not, is that the right answer? Okay, that's wrong, not good. But it's, okay, now you try it. Okay, what, can you do it differently? What about you? Um, in a classroom, maybe they don't need to stand up, but you need, I asked her to stand up for visibility in this room. Okay, that's the end of that little pause comment. Okay, I'd like you to say it again, please. You can do the gestures or the, whatever you do with your face. This time, I'd like you to listen to her saying it. Concentrate on listening. When she finishes speaking, don't say anything, don't make a comment, don't laugh, don't do anything like that. Just have silence. And in the silence, see if you can replay the words that she said in your head. So listen to her and then replay it on that little MP3 player in your head. Okay? Can you still hear it? Can you still hear her voice? Okay. Okay. Change it into your voice in your head. Change it into your voice. Can you do that? Can you change it to your voice? Thank you. You can sit down. I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and say the sentence, but don't say any of the words. I'd like you just to hum the music of the sentence. Okay, turn to the person on the other side or behind you, a different person, and now say the sentence. And now everybody say the sentence to me. Okay, could you say the sentence to me, please? <laughs> How was her sentence different from <laughs> How was hers different from mine? I was showing more surprise. So how did, how did you know I was more surprised? Okay, t t don't just say intonation. What about it? What, what was different? More stress, yeah? Okay, but what about the intonation? I, okay, I'll tell you, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I can't really deal with so many people shouting different things. I, I think I was louder, and I was higher as well in pitch, yes? So, and so that made the whole thing sound more, more surprised. Okay, so I'm going to say now, I've never eaten a tomato. Did I change any words when I said my reply? The, the pronoun, yes? I changed I to... You, which, okay, so, okay, so now I'm going to say I've never eaten a tomato. Can you say the reply? What's the reply? You have, you've never eaten a tomato. What's this word? What's this word? Uh, it's not a, students will say a, so you can correct them. No, uh, a tomato, okay. Okay. I've never eaten a tomato. <laughs> okay. And so on and so on. What I'm, I, I'm not trying to show you specific techniques, although there's quite a number of interesting techniques involved in what I've been doing. What I'm trying to show is you can be playful with language. Now, I don't know how much you enjoyed that. I, I can't guess, but there was... From my position here, I saw some, quite a lot of laughter. I saw quite a lot of people going, what's he on about? He must be crazy. Uh, I saw quite a lot of people trying things. Um, what I'm suggesting is we can be playful with language. We don't need the extra games very often. We can have a lot of fun just with ready-made sentences. This is a ready-made sentence. 
And simply letting students get their mouths around it, try saying it to each other, get a bit of feeling into it, even without knowing what the context is yet, there's a lot of value in that. Because from seeds, like this sentence, whole tenses grow. From, I've never eaten a tomato, we can go on quite easily. We've, we've, we've read it and we've tried to, to go on to a second step of making it sound a little bit more like real spoken English. Exaggerated, okay, but that's funny, that's more memorable maybe. Um, we can go on and substitute. Somebody was suggesting they don't want to use the word tomato. Okay, can you think of another word? I've never eaten a... I've never eaten frog's legs. Um, which is interesting grammatically because you have to lose a. Uh, I've never eaten frog's legs. Um, we could change the verb. It could start to be something different. I've never ridden a bicycle could come out of just small substitutions to this. As we've already seen, we can change the pronoun. Just playing around like this, saying, OK, change one word, change a different word. Put something else in now. now. Now you say it to her, you say it to him. Now say it loudly, now say it angrily. Just doing that, the students are getting the whole of the present perfect tense. They will start to be able to make their own sentences, almost without needing any explanation about how it works, how the grammar works. It's not a, not a big step then to personalize it. Okay, you've been saying I've never eaten a tomato, but I expect every single person in the room has eaten a tomato. So now say a sentence that is true about you, and you ask the students to start making true sentences. So as I say, it's a very small seed. It's a single sentence. But I'm a great believer in teaching from small upwards as well as teaching from big downwards. The modern 20th first century teaching, we're told, is very much about the holistic beginning. You start big, you start with whole texts, you work down from that. Well, there's clearly value in that. It's clearly important and useful. But don't forget the other direction. Starting small and building up is also very valuable. And of course, our goal eventually is that students can use the item out in the real world. And I'm suggesting they don't need to leap straight from meeting the item to use. There are possible steps in between that can be very valuable. Okay, I'm just going to move my slides on if it listens to me. Okay, I'd like to talk about something, something different. That, so that's, that's one sort of set of ideas there. We're very, as teachers, we're very tied up with, did my student get it right? Is it right or wrong? Is that a correct answer or an incorrect answer? And obviously, it's important in lots of situations to know correct or not correct. But it's actually quite a, a limited concept, correct and not correct, correct and incorrect. And it would be very helpful in many classroom situations if we could broaden our view from just black and white, correct, incorrect. I'd like to suggest an idea to you that is, 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 is taking that a step further. The idea is called upgrade steps. And my proposal to you is that instead of just right and wrong, there are actually a whole pile of steps between not knowing anything about a language item to being able to use it you know, as a very competent language user. There are lots of steps. For example, imagine your students are learning a new language item. I don't know, used to, for example. So imagine they're learning it. At the bottom of the, 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 the the pattern, the, the beginning is, I have no idea. At some point, the students have no idea about used to. They've never heard it, never read it, have no idea what, it, what it's used for. They don't even spot it, maybe, because they think it's something else when they come across it in a text. So they start with no idea. But there are lots of places before we get to perfection. I have an initial idea of the form. I have an initial idea of the meaning and use. I can say the sentence, approximately. I can write the sentence approximately. I can put the words in the right order. I can make the words with the right forms and endings. I can spell the forms accurately. Interestingly, for many teachers in many classrooms, those last three, I can put the words in the right order, I can do the right forms and endings, and I can spell them. That is the dividing line for many teachers between saying correct or incorrect. If the students put the words in the right order with the right endings, and spelt accurately, the teacher will typically say, good, correct. 
But there are places to go beyond that. That's, that's not the end. I can say the words with good sounds. I can say the sentence with good stress. I can approximate the intonation. I can say the sentence with meaningful intonation. I can make simple substitutions to the sentence to change the message. I can do all this increasingly fluently. I can use the grammar to convey the message I want to. I can fine-tune my meanings. And then I can integrate all that, all the new language, with everything I already know to start to convey meanings. So I'm suggesting there are lots of places between zero and 100%. And what that means is you're not stuck in a classroom with the good students and the weak students. And the weak student, you ask a question to, and she gets it wrong. And every time you have to say, no, that's not correct. Sorry, that's wrong. And the good student puts up their hand and says, I can do it. And she's got the right words in the right order. So every time you have to say, good, well done, that's correct. If you have this sort of thing in your head, whatever anybody says, you can push them to get a little bit better. Because from any point, until you reach the very top, there is an upgrade that is possible. This idea of upgrade, whatever a student says, can you help them to make a bit better? So she doesn't always get negative feedback, she doesn't always get positive feedback, everybody gets feedback to help them to become slightly better. Let me just clarify, upgrade versus correction. An upgrade improves whatever is offered. It could be a mistake or not a mistake, into the best the student can do at that moment. Whatever you say, I'll help you to do it slightly better. A correction makes something wrong into something correct. Please notice, you don't need to have a mistake to do an upgrade. Whatever your student says, you can help them to get better. Your weaker student starts to feel better because it's not only her that gets told a correction every time. If there's a mistake, the upgrade includes the mistake. If there's no mistake, you can still upgrade. Um, I quite like, I quite like uh, acronyms. Here's one for you. I'm sorry, it's a made-up one and it's a bit rubbish, but here it is. Proof. And it stands for Playful Challenge, Repeated Opportunities, Upgrade Feedback. Can I give my students whatever they say or whatever they write, can I give them a little challenge to get it better, to make it better? And not just a single opportunity to do that, but a number of opportunities. And the way that I will do that is by giving them feedback that helps them to upgrade. So I want them to get tangibly, audibly better in this weird foreign language. I'm not asking for a big step forward, just a small step, a little upgrade. Maybe something like, OK, you've got all the words in the right order, the endings are right, the grammar is right. Can you say it faster? And say it faster is a really good challenge for stronger students in the class. Can you say it at twice the speed? That's, I, I recommend that one to you as a little playful challenge. And I'm not just going to give you one opportunity to do it. I'm, I'm not interested in just, you got it right, I'm moving on. I'm interested in, can you, whoever you are, whatever your level in this class, can you get better from where you are? That may take three, four, five goes, maybe more. But I'm going to say something like, OK, you've got the right words in the right order, the grammar's good, can you say it twice as fast? And she has a go. And it's, it's OK, but it's, the sounds start to go. And I say, do you know what problems were there? And she might know herself, so she can say, let me try it again. So she has another go. And I say, OK, I'm going to say it now, listen to me. And I say it, and then she tries it again. And she hasn't quite got it. So I say, do you want one more go? And she has one more go. And it's significantly better than the first time she did it significantly better. It's taken 40 seconds or so. 40 seconds of a little one-to-one -one lesson in the middle of the whole class. I've got to keep my eye on everybody else. If they're not interested in what's going on, then I've got a problem. But generally, they're fascinated by this kind of thing because they're thinking, oh, I, I'd like to try that. That's interesting. I wonder if I could do that. And maybe if they are showing that they're going onto Facebook or something, I can suddenly say, just a minute, and come across the room to somebody else. You try it and then come back to my little one-to-one -one mini lesson with this student. I'd like to give you more than one opportunity because whatever you produced, you were somewhere on the continuum between rubbish 
and competent language use. And I'd like to nudge you just a little bit further along that line, just a tiny bit further. And my tool for doing it is going to be giving you feedback. Not about everything at once, not about every mistake and every problem, but a small, achievable step. I can do that, as I just said, by modeling for myself. I can actually say it myself. It may just be a sound, maybe a whole sentence, maybe a chunk of language, but I can model it by myself and ask you to copy it. Other ways of giving feedback. Um, I, I used my fingers. I could, I could show you the structure of your sentence on my fingers and point out where the problem is, the third word, for example. Or I can, I can tap the rhythm and you can listen to that and then try and say it according to that rhythm. I can ask a question. For example, if a student says to me, I, I go dancing last night. And I say, are you talking about now or the past? The question may be enough to make the student go, oh, yes, and change, change what they've just said. Or I can give feedback by simply giving an instruction, like say it faster, or use past simple verbs. Um, I'd like to show you one more, one more idea before I stop. And this idea is called 3XP. And 3XP stands for three times practice. And you can probably already guess what, what I'm talking about. Um, don't worry about the exercise. This is just a picture as an example of an exercise. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. I, I get nervous when I see teachers using exercises, and often when I use exercises myself, and the teachers go through and say, okay, what's the answer number one? What's the answer number two? What's the answer number three? Good, 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 good. And I sort of think, okay, they've, they've got the right answers. The, the teachers check the answers. They're, they're mostly correct. One or two mistakes corrected. But was that really as much learning as was possible from that exercise? You know? Sorry. Was that really the most that was possible for an exercise? Would it be possible to go back into the exercise again, like a gold miner, and actually get a little bit more out of it? Actually get a bit more, extract a bit more value from it? And that's all the 3XP idea is. It suggests that rather than just doing an exercise and moving on, do an exercise and then do it again and then do it again. Not the same, but slightly differently each time. Here's an example. So first time. We do the exercise, then we check it, just as normal. So number one, do what you normally do. But instead of moving on, go back in and find if there's learning still unlearned. My experience is that most students can go through an exercise, they'll come out of it, and they haven't learned a single thing that was actually in the exercise. They haven't got the thing that the exercise was about. So here we are, we go back in a second time. Okay, guys, you've done the exercise. Now cover the words, cover the exercise up. Can you remember the sentences in the exercise? Can you remember them? Say them to your partner. It's not a test. It's not a test. Whenever you want to, don't have to ask me, whenever you want to, you just uncover it and, and have a look. And then when you've done that, cover it up again. Just test yourself with your partner. Can you remember the, the sentences? This is addressing something that contemporary language teaching hardly addresses at all, memory. If you'd learned a language sort of, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, memory would have been a significantly bigger part of language learning. Students went home with long lists of words. Students learned whole texts by heart. Um, nowadays, memory is so important, but we hardly address it in much language teaching. I can't speak for you. I don't know what you do in your classes. So if that's not true for you, please exclude yourself from that comment. But this addresses memory in a, in a fun, interesting, engaging way. It's not adding on a game. It's the language itself. What's happening in this game-like activity is that the students are taking the exercise off the page, dead language on the page, and making it living language inside their heads. They're actually putting into their database all these pieces of language that will start to become available for them to use themselves. And then we've done that. We've got a bit bored with that. OK, number three. Let's go in again. Now, practice saying the sentences more naturally. Say, say them to each other. Say them to me. Think about your face. Think about any gestures you use. So say them to each other. 
I'm not saying this is the only way to 3XP, this is just an example, but the idea of going in three times and seeing if you can extract real value from, from it. But it's a one for the money, two for the show, but we get ready now, go, can't go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Well, of course, that's Elvis. Um, you're probably wishing I'd stop talking and just let you listen to that. Uh, um, um, when, when, I, when Adrian and myself, when we talked about this 3XP idea, uh, he came up with an interesting uh, version. Well, one for the exercise, just do the exercise as normal. Two, go back in again and see if you can get some, some real further learning out of it. Don't do it if there's no more learning to be had, but almost always there is more learning to be had. Three, in English, can you change it from dead language into English? That means with a bit of emotion maybe, with some intonation, with some feeling, uh, with some speaking usually. So that's Elvis Underhill. <laughs> so, I'm coming to the end of my time. Um, I'm just going to mention something that came up, came up yesterday in the classroom management uh, talk that I did. I mentioned the idea of not rubber stamping, and this seems to me to be such a crucial uh, importance for teaching. I'd just like to mention it briefly again. Not rubber stamping refers to not validating what the student says immediately. So, for example, um, what's the capital of uh, Great Britain? Good, good, very good, excellent, fantastic, good, good. Uh, do you agree? Now, what's she going to say? She's going to say yes, because I've rubber-stamped his answer. I've put my, my rubber stamp of validation on his answer. If I can just hold back on that very slightly, if I cannot immediately rubber-stamp, then there's so much more potential for doing the kinds of things that I was talking about in this session. So, what's the capital of Great Britain? <laughs> could, you, could, you give the, could you give the right answer again, just, uh, just for the example? Because <laughs> you just destroy it. <laughs> what's, what's the capital of Great Britain? Aha, uh -huh, so you think London. What about you? Do you see what I've done? Just by saying, so you think, it gives me the possibility to ask other people. It hasn't extinguished the question. If I can find ways not to extinguish the question, I get so much more out of the lessons. What, we've, what I mentioned today, I've mentioned that examples are input, and playing with examples is practice. And you can get a tremendous amount out of ready-made language. They don't need to go straight for communicative practice. They don't need to start forming their own sentences about their love life in the, in the first minute of meeting a new bit of grammar. I've told you about 3XP, the idea that you can go back in three times into an exercise. One for the exercise, two for the learning, three in English was Elvis's suggestion. I suggested upgrade feedback is very powerful. It's much more powerful than praise. Praise, if everything a student says you say good, they have no reason to improve. They just sit back and think, okay, I'm great. Instead of praise, when a student says something that's pretty good, you can give feedback to help them to make it better. And I suggested that little acronym of PROOF. Give them a playful challenge, give them repeated opportunities, and give them upgrade feedback. <laughs> generally speaking, you can't read that probably, but I'm generally suggesting don't get caught up in corrects and rights and wrongs too much, and don't jump on people when they make mistakes. Can you make the language classroom into a playful place where people are experimenting with language, saying things, and it doesn't, doesn't matter too much if it's right or it's wrong. You're going to just keep nudging, 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 and you're going to nudge different people, and you're going to ask him, and then you're going to ask her, and then you're going to ask her, and you're constantly, constantly pushing. Be playful, be challenging. Push gently, often. Thank you.
Thank you very much. If you're interested in any of the ideas, there is a blog and a Facebook page, actually. There's a blog called Demand High ELT. One way to find it is you go to Google and you type Demand High ELT, and it comes up with the blog, which has quite a lot of stuff to read if you're interested in this idea that I've been talking about today of just nudging your students a little bit more. If you want... Oh, just a minute, sorry, not that page. Sorry. Um, up here, there is, if you'd like the web address, that's the address up there. I'm also on Twitter. I've been sponsored here by Bell, and I hope I'll see some of you in the summer at our teacher campus where we run lots of teacher training programs, two-week programs, uh, funded usually by the European Union. So if you're not coming this year, please make sure that you apply for next year and get your funding for a free course, and we'd love to, we'd love to see. We're in a Cambridge University college, so it's a fantastic location for teacher refresher methodology programs. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.